the sermon ready? So what are we going to say?
Good morning, we welcome you to First United Methodist Church here in San Diego. It's a joy to have you with us today. This is Consecration Sunday, and we want you to know this will be on the honor system. If you bring a pledge in uh, today, or if you've already sent one, or you're planning to send one, we have a mug for you that says, Peace of Christ, over in the office. You can just stop by and say, I gave it home, and, or whatever, and uh, they'll give you a mug today. Um, I want to invite Kenton Huntley to, Huntley to come up, and Kenton is our director of ministry with youth, and he and I uh, decided we needed to share some information with you. So you're first. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kenton Reeves Hundley, and I'm the Director of uh, Discipleship for Children and Youth Services here at First United Methodist Church. Um, as many of you know, we already, this fall, this summer and fall, we have a very robust and full Sunday morning schedule for all of our children and youth, um, as well as parents. Uh, from 1030 to 1130, we have a parents group that meets every Sunday called Strengthening Faithful Families. With that, we have a void of Chaperones, we'll call them, not volunteers, chaperones. So I'm here to petition chaperones, anyone, uh, young adults, adults, older adults, can I say I that? Think, I think we talked about grandparent types too. Okay, grandparent we? types. Yeah. Um, anyone that has a love in their heart for children, we're looking for some help. Um, you can work with us for 30 to 60 minute bursts, that would be wonderful. Um, and I have a sign up sheet here that I'll put over in the church office in just a few minutes. So sign up sheet in the church office. Sign up sheet, church office is over there. And uh, what we're looking for is anyone who can give some of their time to help us out to keep the, um, our youngest discipleships fl disciples flowing through the morning. And um, with our safe sanctuaries policy, we always want to make sure we have two adults with us at all times um, to keep this place safe and keep the kids happy. And sometimes it's as simple as a child needs an escort from one place on campus to another. Mm -hmm. And we always want two adults, so we're trying to recruit some uh, to help make that safe. This is a good man. He and Priscilla are doing great work with thank our children so and youth. Let's thank them for that. Thanks. So, much, I Thanks. so this sign-up sheet will be in the church office at the front desk, and hopefully it'll be full before too long. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, some of you have asked why I'm wearing a black preaching robe. Well, the real reason is I like it, but the reason I'm doing it is because my other robe broke this morning, and uh, I wore this one, and it reminds me to tell you, the veterans, that on November 11th is Veterans Sunday, Veterans Day and Veterans Sunday, and you're invited to wear your uniform, if, if it still fits, and, uh, and come and join in the celebration on that day. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. We'll be remembering those who have died in the last year and uh, you'll want to be a part of that uh, time together. Uh, the flowers today are given by Charlene Hone in loving memory of Charles Warren Levitt, her father, and she remembers him at this birthday season, this day, every year. Uh, as I said, this is Consecration Sunday. Uh, one of the challenges uh, for us is to try to get our budget aligned with our mission and uh, we've made some difficult decisions that I need to tell you a bit about. We had to do a staff realignment and focus our staff in some directions. Uh, that meant that we laid off uh, several staff, five staff members this past week. Very hard work to do, hard to know what to do, but I know that the first part of good stewardship is being a good steward. And we've run a deficit here uh, for the last four years. And it was time for us to say, next year, when the new pastor is here, I want him or her to get all the credit uh, for having been uh, able to come to a church and have a budget that's in line. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, and if you want to know more about those staff uh, layoffs, there is word in our e-news and on the website that can give you more information. And so don't forget, there's a mug with the peace of Christ for those of you that on the honor system 
are giving or making a pledge over in the church office. And with that, let's see, what should I say? May the peace of Christ be with you. Would you please stand as we share the peace? Would you remain standing as the choir leads us in worship with the introit?
I invite you to join me in the invocation. God of grace, we come with all we have, bodies, souls, minds, all here to worship you. We have come for a glimpse of your kingdom of kindness, a world where love rules over all, a world where enemies embrace, distinction between friend and foe evaporating in the light of your love. We dedicate this hour of worship to you and to your kingdom come. Amen.
Thank you. I'd like to invite the children to come forward now. If there are parents with children who'd like to bring them forward, you're welcome to join at this time. They'll be going to Sunday school in just a minute. I'm going to ask uh, Jay Bond to welcome them forward with a song. And we welcome all God's children to the front of the sanctuary. You can have a seat anywhere, wherever you're happy. Good morning, 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 so good to see you. Hey, have you ever noticed that pastors in the church wear these things? Have you ever seen? Do you see Pastor Phil wearing one? Yes. Yeah, do you know what these are called? No. Robe. This is called a stole. Do you know how you stole a robe? Well, the robe is what he has on underneath. Can you stand up, Pastor Phil? You'll be our model. <laughs> Pastor, see how he has a nice, nice, <laughs> a nice fancy robe. It's very fancy, isn't it? Isn't it very fancy and beautiful? Very, very slick. These, these are called stoles, but you know how they started? Every, well, here's, you know, the stole is something that is given to all of us who are pastors. When we become pastors, they put a stole on us, and when they send us to serve at a church, we're supposed to remember where this stole came from. And did you know that the original stoles were actually towels? In the early, very first Christian churches, they were like towels, and the pastors or people would wear the towels around their necks, but if somebody needed a little cleaning up, they had a towel. Do any of you need a little cleaning up? I'm looking at, I see some shoes here. Some shoes that could use a little cleaning up. Yeah. I have a question. Is it like ice does that mean, I have a question for you, does that mean that only pastors get to do the cleaning up? No. No. In churches, we're all supposed to help each other. It's kind of like being a servant to each other. So here, I'd like to ask your help. Will you hold on to that end? Will you grab that end? Let's see how many shoes we can clean up at one time with this stole. All right? Yeah, you get your feet there. Are you ready? All righty, let's start cleaning. Come on. Yeah. In church, we can all be servants to one another. And when pastors are sent to a church, they're reminded to be a servant. When I was sent here, I was asked to be a servant. When Pastor Phil was sent here, he was asked to be a servant. When Pastor Melissa was sent here, she was asked to be a servant. We can all be servants to each other. Will you pray with me? Let us pray. God, thank you for calling us to serve one another and help us to follow Jesus, who set us the best example of all. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for these beautiful children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can now go to Sunday school with your Sunday school teachers who are here and with Miss Priscilla and teacher Kenton. They'll lead you to Sunday school. Let's sing the children out with this song. please be in an attitude of prayer with me. Gracious and most holy Lord, as we sit in this beautiful sanctuary, may our hearts be open to honor and worship you. As we look out on your creation, the trees, flowers, and sunshine, we are thankful for the beauty of this earth that you have given us. We come here today to praise and worship you, Father, yet many of us have broken and troubled hearts. We struggle day by day in turmoil, transition, 
and distractions. We are lost in the wilderness of a broken and hurting world and without self-control. We are in desperate need of redemption, forgiveness, and love, but too often we seek it in the wrong places and with the wrong people. We forget to set the table and focus on a new direction, a direction that will keep our eyes and hearts centered on Jesus, who leads the way and is the truth and the light. Fill our hearts with love and compassion as we pray for the staff who were impacted this week by difficult decisions here at our church. We also offer our heartfelt prayers and condolences to our Jewish brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh who were ambushed as they worshiped in their synagogue yesterday. Be with those injured to heal and the families of those who were tragically killed. Comfort each one as they struggle to grasp their loss. At times, some things we are called to do may not be easy. Some may be a burden and even difficult. But by serving you, Lord, we receive your forgiveness and generous love, and our burdens are lighter. As we prepare for the consecration of our pledges and gifts, keep our lives focused on you, Lord. Lift up our hearts with grateful thanksgiving for the many blessings you have given each of us. As your servants, let us remember, you are Lord of all, and we humbly give, your glory, give you glory as we set the table, striving to become good stewards. In your holy Son's name we pray, amen. And now with the confidence as your children, God, let us stand together and pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. We have a word every Sunday uh, about this, this Sunday, Consecration Sunday, a time to set the table, and we've asked Rick Snyder to share a word with you this Sunday. growing in grace, reaching out with love, being disciples of Jesus Christ. That is what this congregation is here representing God's will. 
It's interesting that in every congregation there are critical moments, inflection points, that drive the future of any church. It's somewhat interesting to me that after 150 years as a congregation, as a church, we are at such a point where we can come together as a, as a congregation um, to reach forward into the future, serving God's will. In order to reach out with God's love, I've come to recognize in my role as uh, chairman of the finance committee and now on the church council, the financial capability of the church in reaching that mission is critical. The alignment, as Pastor said, of church resources um, in order to meet those missions. We are an amazing group of people committed to growing in grace and reaching out in love. I want to thank you on, part of, on the part of the church council for your commitment of discipleship, to your giving, to your commitment of service, and helping us serve and set the table for God's will. Thank you for this Commitment Sunday. Now let us join together in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen.
I don't know about you all, but I got chills. It's beautiful. Please remain standing, if you will, for the scripture lesson for today from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Now hear the words of the gospel. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as the rulers lord over them and their great ones are tyrants over them but it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you. You may be seated. We pause today in this moment to share in prayers for the people of Pittsburgh and our nation. Uh, the attack on the Tree of Life synagogue has quite literally struck Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. His home was only three blocks from that synagogue. I wrote a uh, note to the congregation yesterday. Some of you have seen it on Facebook. It will be sent to you by email. And I also reached out to our friends at Beth Israel. Uh, we met with them only last week, the rabbis, uh, to plan for our Thanksgiving service on the 21st of this month. It will be uh, at 7.30 in the evening. I hope you will come and stand in solidarity with our Jewish brothers and sisters here in San Diego and around the world. Uh, Rabbi Burke sent me back a lovely little note this morning that said, thank you so much for your beautiful and supportive message. The Jewish community has been traumatized by this, but we won't be for long. After a history of anti-Semitism, we're pretty good about picking ourselves up and putting one foot in front of another. What makes America special is friends like you at First United Methodist Church. We are grateful. So I invite you now to pause for a moment as we pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, you alone are the source of all health and life and sustainer of all of our hopes. You have made us members of one human family. We are attached like muscle, sinew, and bone when one suffers, we all suffer. We pray for the people of Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh as they mourn today. Grant them comfort and strength. We pray for Jewish communities everywhere, for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society that has also been the target of hate. We especially remember Jewish friends here in San Diego and our neighbors at Temple Beth Israel. Grant us all of us, the wisdom and courage to walk ahead together in justice and kindness. Oh God, our nation, our psyches are reeling from what appears to be a societal violence disorder. Terrence, te terror has replaced reason. Conspiracies are replacing conversation. Dishonesty is the new currency for control. The fabric of our common life seems to be in tatters. Strengthen us, O oh God, reweave us as communities of respect. We pray for your consolation for those who mourn in Pittsburgh, for the two apparently targeted African Americans murdered this week in Jefferson Town, Kentucky for those threatened with pipe bombs this past week. We remember the tragedies of places like Columbine, Orlando, Las Vegas, Newtown, Parkland, and so many others. Be with all those families who experience their tragedies anew by this violence. Oh God, we will seek to transform the world by doing what Jesus taught us, welcoming a stranger, loving our enemy, and working for reconciliation. May your spirit bind up our broken hearts when all we seem to have left are tears of confusion and pain. Give us hope. Lord, remake our visions of power and prominence into dreams of service and compassion. Amen.
We have been considering in recent weeks great questions from Mark's Gospels, uh, and especially the middle chapters of the book of Mark's. Questions like, who will set the table? Where may I find abundant life? How may I be like a child again? When might I see? All these are great questions. Today we're asking the question, who can be great? The conclusion of the sermon normally is offered at the end of the sermon. That's the appropriate place, not the beginning. But as I was reading this week, I found a little book by Henry Nouwen. It's a collection of his writings from the last year of his life entitled Sabbath Journey. And in it, I find his list of questions that are far better than mine. We find these questions. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? Now in writes, These are the real questions. James and John approached Jesus with remarkable brashness saying, teacher, we want you to do for us what we ask of you. Apparently James and John felt that they were now in the real true center of Jesus's affection. They were the center of his associates. Whatever they ask, These we might call the entitlement disciples. Uh, I sat by a woman one day in Central America. She was there at an orphanage. I found out that she had been there for six months. She had only intended to come for two weeks. Until recently, she said, I lived my life focused only on myself. I have three beautiful children, a fine husband, a beautiful home and plenty of clothes, but none of that ever seemed to be enough to make me happy. Someone somehow had convinced me that others always owed me something. My appetites were insatiable, she says. I was unhappy with everything. She paused and then looked at the children playing in the yard and quietly said, I was seeking something but was running as fast as I could in the wrong direction. James and John were pursuing personal prominence. They wanted to sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus when he came into his glory. In Middle Eastern mind, uh, these were positions of great authority, symbolized by direct access to power. These two sons of Zebedee were climbing the social ladder These boys didn't lack initiative. They were hungry to be successful, but they were headed in the wrong direction, dreaming the wrong dreams. Like them, I often get confused about what true greatness is. Jesus needs to remind us, sometimes we're pursuing fool's gold, false status, imaginary dreams, You see, all people are great. That's what Jesus is trying to say. There are some biblical scholars who also suggest that maybe James and John are foreshadowing the two thieves on the cross on either side of Jesus when that's where glory takes him. Francis Schaeffer wrote, there are no little people in the kingdom of God. Everyone is the same level. Everyone is great. And Don Crable wrote, the point is that the upside down kingdom is one where everyone is the greatest. Uh, This week, maybe you saw the conclusion of the Great American Read. I assume some of you know which book won the award. 4.3 million people voted, and the winner was To Kill a Mockingbird, that's right, by Harper Lee. 
Elaine and I had the privilege of visiting Monroeville, Alabama. It's not a place you would normally go. It's out of the beaten path, off the beaten path, but we had a friend there and we went to see Thomas Lane Butts. By the way, uh, Tom once preached in this congregation. Uh, Dr. Trotter, I'd have to figure out when, uh, but it wasn't you, before you. Oh, it was Jim Standiford, okay. Well, no, <laughs> well, he was fibbing to me then. Uh, anyway, Tom said he came out to preach, and when he got home, his wife Hilda said, Tom, how, how much did they pay you for that sermon? And he said, why, why, Hilda, it was $500. And she said, Tom, you don't have a $500 sermon. <laughs> Tom was a friend of Harper Lee. They had breakfast together every Thursday at the Hardee's restaurant in Monroeville. Two of the treasured possessions that Elaine and I have on our bookshelf back in Indiana are two autographed copies of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Tom helped arrange that. She captures in that book that sense that all are to be treated with the same sense of respect, and honor. Oh, I'm not talking just about the story of Tom Robertson. I'm talking about little Scout, who at one point says to her brother, Nah, Jim, I think there's just one kind of folks. Folks. Just one kind of folks. Folks. All are equal. And then Atticus, of course, tries to teach little Scout. I'll teach you a little trick, he says. You'll get along a lot better if you know this about folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from that person's point of view. You climb into his skin and walk around in it. The other disciples weren't very happy that these two were asking for special privilege. It may just be that James and John got to Jesus first. They, too, aspired to be great. They, too, thought that they could sit in positions of power and authority. So far as I know, there's no church anywhere that's named the First Christian Church of Grumbling Christians. If there were, this would have been the first one right there. These followers of Jesus the Christ who end up grumbling about their position. And Jesus calls upon them to move from being skeptics to being servants, from being grumblers to being givers, from being complainers to being a part of a community of servants. I have trouble with the word servanthood. I have for years. It can so easily be misused. In fact, my friend John McKnight wrote an article a few years ago that simply is entitled, Why Servanthood is Bad. His two-sentence summary would be, peddling services instead of building communities is the one way we can be sure not to help. He goes on, you must struggle with all your might to reclaim the central Christian act of hospitality by not making others into your clients. He points to John 15:15, 15, 15, where you may remember Jesus says to the disciples, I will no longer call you servants, but friends. You see, servanthood can so easily assume a hierarchical status. Uh, what's the, what's the uh, weird owl says uh, of, the, of the Amish, the humble Amishman? Uh, I am much more hum humble, a million times so more humble than thee, my brother. A reversed kind of pride. Jesus, however, is modeling a servanthood that's very different. Philippians 2 talks about he took on the form of a servant. He was, in fact, 
the foot-washing Messiah. So you're invited to consider being a part of a community of servants here at this congregation, not just one that's out for privilege or some special status. I came in to the sanctuary thinking I was going to pray on Friday morning. I needed it because this sermon was still just a, a vague hope. And when I got in here, uh, the sermon sort of found itself because there were eight women cleaning and putting, straightening the pew racks. Have you noticed? They don't ask to be honored or to take bows. But more than one person has said to me, your pew racks are always in such fine order. That doesn't happen by accident. Humble servants. We're asking you to share in your volunteer work or your servanthood and your giving. Even before we arrived this Sunday, over 50 pledges had come in and already uh, $160,000 has been pledged for next year. Over half of those pledges were an increase. You know, we were asking people to consider doing a little more, 13, uh, the baker's dozen. If you were going to give for 12 months, could you add a month? And people are doing that. The finance office hopes that you'll bring your pledges um, before November 14th. And don't forget, if you want, you can go get a mug today. I'll even let some of you get one if you haven't brought your pledge yet. Jesus was asking the disciples to consider what it means to serve others first. There was an urgency at the heart of this. The verb to serve is one that expresses urgency. It's the verb that's used when the angels come to minister to Jesus in the wilderness. It's the verb that's used, you remember Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law when she's healed and immediately she gets up and begins to serve others? That's this verb. That's what this is about. Oh, and it's not just the pew rack stuffers. There's so many other quiet ones around here the chain gang, those who decorate for Advent and Christmas, those who come and stuff bulletins, stuff envelopes. I see it all the time, the ones who gather the list for the poinsettias. It's an old line, but one that serves this moment well. Albert Schweitzer was asked to name the greatest living person Without hesitation, he replied, the greatest person in the world is some unknown individual who at this very moment has gone in love to help another person in need. Parker Palmer tells the story about a visitor coming to the Quaker community at Pendle Hill, Pennsylvania. They went in to the worship service and Parker says, I was sitting there, and we were quiet for three minutes. It was a Quaker service, five minutes, seven minutes, nothing said, ten minutes. And finally, his friend, who was not familiar, leaned over and said, when, when does the service begin? And Parker said, I responded, oh, the, the service starts when worship ends. Years ago, I was in a church, and uh, I thought it was clever. I still kind of do. They didn't all like it very much, but I made some new signs for the exits at the doors. They actually stayed up for several weeks. Right next to where it says exit on all the doors, I put another sign, and it simply read, Servants Entrance. And so from Henry now and again, these questions. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let my anger, let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? 
These, you see, are the real questions. Amen. If you brought your pledge card with you, I ask that you hang on to it until the end of the service. We'll be uh, bringing them forth during our consecration hymn. At this time, we give our tithes and our offerings to God, and I invite the ushers to come forward.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We give in grateful thanksgiving for all that God has given us. In the upside down world of the gospel, we measure our wealth not by what we have, but by what we give away. Let us give away generously in this offering to bless your church, your people, your creation. Amen. My, you are a wonderful people, a great community of servants. And we pray that these pledges and all the other ways that you serve, the gifts that you give, will be directed as best we can to the glory of God. And so now may you go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide you. And may God the Father always be before you. For we pray this in their name. Amen.
We got two minutes. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Javon, for one, again, a great way to open worship with the prelude. Uh, those of you that uh, are new, we welcome you. There's a place uh, you can uh, be greeted out here and learn more about the church just out on the patio. There's a little a booth there. And we encourage all of you to take the little yellow card and please sign that and let us know of your attendance. 
Um, I'm wearing a black robe today, not for any other reason than my other robe uh, was broken, was torn. And so I put on the black robe, but that's a way to remind you that uh, those of you that are veterans, in two weeks will be Veterans Day, Veterans Sunday, and please uh, plan to wear your uniform if you can still get into it. Um, it would be great to uh, have all of our veterans here. Next Sunday we'll be uh, remembering All Saints Day and those that have died in the last uh, year. So if you have someone you want to, to be remembered, please contact the church office. Uh, the flowers today are given by Charlene Hone in loving memory of Charles Warren Levitt, her father, and this, is, this would be his birthday. And so we recognize that. Uh, this has been a difficult week in many ways, but here at the church, uh, we were facing the reality that we needed to be very careful with our funds and our budgeting for the future. Uh, this will be the fourth year in a row we will have run a deficit in our budget, and uh, it just wasn't something we could sustain. We had to make the very difficult decision to align our resources a little better uh, with our ministries, and that resulted in the painful work of, of uh, letting some staff go. And so there were uh, five and a half uh, staff positions that were reduced, but I know this, one, we pray for those dear people, good people, uh, and two, if we're going to expect you to be stewards, we have to be good stewards at the church. And uh, we needed to make these adjustments so that our ministry can continue uh, to thrive and be sustained. And so please join us. This is Consecration Sunday. Now, I need to uh, put you on the honor system because we have mugs uh, for you that simply say the peace of Christ. And they're over in the church office and you can pick one up after church. If you make a pledge or if you plan to give or if you wanna throw an extra buck in the plate today, please go over to the office and pick up one of the mugs that simply says the peace of Christ. It's part of what uh, we do here to greet one another. And so with that said, what do you think we should do next? May the peace of Christ be with you. Would you please share the peace with one another? And now would you remain standing as the choir leads us into worship by singing the introit.
Please join me in our invocation. Let us pray. God of grace, we come with all we have, bodies, souls, minds, all here to worship you. We have come for a glimpse of your kingdom of kindness, a world where love rules over all, a world where enemies embrace, distinctions between friend and foe evaporating in the light of your love. We dedicate this hour of worship to you and to your kingdom come. Amen.
Good morning. Will you please join with me in an attitude of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, in this crazy world in which we live sometimes, we have days that end in why. It can be difficult to understand why things go the way they do. During this time, we always need to remember we have your constant presence and guidance and love in our lives. When all we have left to do is to cry out in the midst of pain, give us hope. When our tears feel like the only way to quench our thirst, remind us of your providing presence. When loneliness seems overwhelming, make your presence known. The world seems so full of death and destruction, but we know you are a God of life and restoration. Mold us into an unwavering people of grace, passion, and love that can never be ignored. We also come to you today seeking forgiveness for all the times that we have failed you. Please forgive us of our sins. We ask that you mend the broken places of our hearts and fill the empty spaces of our souls with your love. For all of those that are in need of healing, for the elderly, for the homeless, for the unemployed, for those that need guidance, we pray for your intercession, Lord. So long ago, there was a prayer Jesus taught his disciples and we repeat that prayer now by saying out loud, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Dana Hook, and I have been privileged to serve as the chair of the church council for the last 14 months, and with God's grace, hope to serve through June of 2019. This morning, I wanted to speak to all of you, and I wanted to share with you what I feel are the opportunities for greatness in our dreams. See, my wife, Chris, and I, we started out, our, like, like many of you, with dreams for our lives. The first dream was that we could live together, that we could combine two good-sized families into one really large family. I won't talk about our 12 grandchildren. Oh, maybe I will later. We could continue, we could continue in this life with that our children would grow up healthy and that we dreamed that we could get married and that our children could get married. These were great dreams. And now, after more than 22 years together, we have seen many of these blessings come to pass in our lives. Like many of you, we've worked hard. We saved to buy a home. We saved for our children's college. We saved for weddings. And we continue to save for retirement years. May they come soon. 
We had times of abundance and times of struggle. And yet always, while we were saving for our dreams, we were also committed to giving to others so that they could have opportunities for their dreams. Now our church has a dream. It's a collective dream, one that more than 200 of you participated in writing, in imagining, and envisioning the future. And in June of this year, in 2018, we as members of the congregation overwhelmingly voted to establish the short document Dreamscape to be our vision of the future for this church. Dreamscape states that we will be united, united in an abiding commitment to grow in grace and reach out with the love of Jesus Christ. We centered our vision around working in ways of compassion and devotion, worship and justice. This is a great dream. I believe that it is a dream in line with the moving of the Holy Spirit. I believe that it is a statement that matches the teachings of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Now during this time of stewardship, and especially on Consecration Sunday, I want to encourage you to join in this movement of the Holy Spirit in First Church. Now is the time for us as individuals, as couples, and families to contribute from our resources to the dream for this church. The steady monthly contribution means so much to the ongoing life and dream of this church. With all of us, there can be greatness in this dream for the church. Not a creation of where the Spirit moved in the past, but a recreation of where the Spirit is moving for the future. That's not what we can see now, but what the prayers and visions of many, the prayers of many of you, have led us to at this time and this place, so that we can continue to grow in grace and reach out with the love of Jesus Christ. There is greatness in our dreams. Please help provide opportunities for this dream to spring to life in the future of this church by your responsiveness to the request for pledges at this time of our church. Thank you very much. Will you now please join me for the prayer up for illumination? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen.
please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Today it comes from Mark 10, 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord.
Thank you. You may be seated. It has been one of those weeks in our nation that uh, we don't enjoy. It's a week marked by tragedy, especially the word that came of the assault of the members of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Just on Thursday, Pastor John and Dr. Wicks and I were visiting with two of the rabbis at um, Beth Israel Synagogue, where we will be sharing a Thanksgiving service on the 21st of November, 7.30 in the evening. I hope many of you will come and join as a witness of solidarity with that congregation on that evening. I drafted a little note to the members of the church yesterday. If you didn't see it on Facebook, it will be, I think, emailed to you uh, probably tomorrow. It will appear on our website. I had a lovely note from the two rabbis, Rabbi Burke, uh, the chief rabbi there, wrote me early this morning to say, thank you very much for this beautiful, supportive message the Jewish community has been traumatized by this, but we won't be there for long. After a history of anti-Semitism, we're pretty good about picking ourselves up and putting one foot in front of another. What makes America special, he wrote, to us is friends like you at First United Methodist Church. We are grateful. And I told the rabbis that we would be having a special time of prayer this morning, remembering uh, our nation and praying for them. So I invite you now to join as we pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all our life, source of health, and sustainer of our hope, you have made us members of one human family. We are attached like muscle and sinew and bone. When one suffers, we all suffer. We pray for the people of Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh as they mourn. Grant them comfort and strength. We pray for Jewish communities everywhere for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society that has also been a target of hate. We especially remember Jewish friends here in San Diego and our neighbors at Temple Beth Israel. Grant all of us the wisdom and courage to walk ahead together in justice and kindness. Our national psyche seems to be reeling from a societal violence disorder Terror has replaced reason. Conspiracies replace conversation. Dishonesty is the new currency for control. The fabric of our common life seems to be in tatters. Strengthen us to reweave our communities in respect. We pray your consolation for those who mourn in Pittsburgh for those two apparently targeted African Americans murdered in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, for those threatened with pipe bombs these, this week, for all of those who remember tragedies in places like Columbine, Orlando, Las Vegas, Newtown, Parkland, and so many other places. Be with those families who experience a new those family tragedies sparked by this violence. Oh God, we will seek to transform the world by doing what Jesus taught us, welcoming the stranger, loving our enemy, and working for reconciliation. May your spirit bind up our broken hearts when all we seem to have left are tears of confusion and pain. Give us hope. Lord, remake our visions of power and prominence into dreams of service and compassion. Amen.
You don't know this, but one of the longest journeys I make in any given week is the journey from the place I sit to the journey where I have to preach. Sometimes it's only one or two steps. It was a few more steps today, but it's quite a journey, isn't it, Bill? You're taking steps toward trying to be a faithful steward. And so it is today. Well, in recent weeks, we've been asking some of the great questions in the Gospels, especially in the center part of Mark's Gospel, questions like, who will set our tables? Uh, Where may we find abundant life? How may I be like a child again? When might I see? All of these are very good questions. Today, we're looking at the question, who can be great? The conclusion of the sermon, I normally have the conclusion where it should be at the end. But today, I'm going to change all of that. I'm going to give you the conclusion right now. It came as I was reading Henry Nouwen's little book, Sabbath Journey. This this is a collection of his writings in the last year of his life. We find there some wonderful questions, I think questions that may help us deal with the question of today, which is, who can be great? Look for these questions. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These, Nowen says, are the real questions, the core questions. James and John come and approach Jesus in this scripture with remarkable brashness. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Apparently, they think they're in the real inner circle here. Whatever we ask, I think these are entitlement disciples. I I sat beside a woman a few years ago in an orphanage in Central America. Uh, She had recently decided to give some time to that orphanage. Actually, she went for two weeks, and it was now six months later. She had gone home a couple of times, but she had suddenly found her place She said to me that day as we were seated together, until recently, I lived my life focused only on myself. I have three beautiful children, a wonderful spouse, a beautiful home, plenty of clothes, but it was never enough for me. I seem never to be happy. Someone somewhere always had more than me or seemed to whet my appetite for something higher than my status or those of my associates. It was insatiable, she said. I was unhappy about everything. She paused and then looked at the children playing around her there, and she said, I was seeking something but was running fast in the wrong direction. That's James and John in our story. Looking for prominence, they want to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus when he comes into glory. Now, this is common, I think, everywhere, but in the Middle East, uh, positions of authority are often symbolized by where one sits in relationship to power. These brothers, sons of Zebedee, are into climbing the ladder, upward mobility. These boys did not lack initiative or imagination. They were hungry to be successful, but they were heading in the wrong direction, dreaming the wrong dreams. Like them, I too often confuse power with greatness. Jesus is saying to them, you're pursuing fool's gold, false status, imaginary dreams. All people are great, he is trying to teach them. Can't you see? 
If you would be master, you must first serve everyone. Uh, some biblical scholars suggest that this text is a foreshadowing of those two criminals on the cross seeking a place beside Jesus in that glory. Francis Schaeffer has said, there are no little people in this kingdom. Everyone is the same level. Everyone is great. And Don Crable once again helps us. The point is, he says, that the upside down kingdom is one where everyone is seen as the greatest. Uh, this week, I don't know if you saw it, but there was the final episode of the special Great American Read on PBS. 4.3 million people voted for the favorite piece of literature uh, among 100 books from many nations and many different authors. Now, I know some of you will know which book was the winner. Yes, there's several, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's by Harper Lee. Elaine and I had the good uh, pleasure of visiting Monroeville, Alabama. You have to go out of the way to get to Monroeville. There's no interstate nearby. Our friend Thomas Lane Butts uh, lives there and he is a lifelong friend, or was until her passing two years ago, of Miss Harper Lee. Tom uh, showed us the uh, home of Harper Lee, the little Methodist church where she worshiped, the little Methodist church where her sister, Alice uh, Lee, was the lay leader, and later the lay leader for the South Alabama Conference. Quite an interesting uh, family, sisters, Methodist there. Tom Butts is uh, a dear friend of ours. As a matter of fact, when I told him I was coming to preach in, at this church, he said, oh, I was once invited to preach there. I said, really? He's, yes, yes, he said. I said, well, tell me about it, Tom. He said, well, I went out and preached, and I came home, and my wife Hilda said, well, Tom... How much did they pray, pay you to preach at that big church? And Tom said, I didn't know whether to tell her, but I did. Well, Hilda, they paid me $500. And she responded, Tom, you don't have a $500 sermon. <laughs> and quickly he said, well, I preached three times. And she said, you don't have a $150 sermon. <laughs> Tom Butts introduced us to Monroeville. He and Harper Lee, when she was living, would go have breakfast together every Thursday at the Hardee's restaurant there in town. And among our treasured possessions, Elaine and I have two copies of To Kill a Mockingbird signed by... Harper Lee on our shelf back in Indiana. That book is a book that understands that everyone is equal. Not just Tom Robinson. It's everyone. There's that little passage, I don't know if you recall it, where Scout is speaking to her younger brother and she says, No, nah, Jim, I think there's only one kind of folks that's folks. All folks are just folks. And in another place, Atticus, her father, says, Scout, I'm going to give you a simple little trick. You'll get along better with all kinds of folks. You'll never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skinned skin and walk around in it. Jesus is trying to teach them about what it means to be servant. Uh, the disciples aren't really happy with this. As you can tell, they begin to complain and grumble. That these other, I think they're worried that the other disciples had gotten ahead of them in line. 
they maybe wanted to ask the same question. They wanted to be important as well. And we have here the story of grumbling early Christians. Now, so far as I know, there's never been anywhere on earth, or there is not today, uh, the first church of grumbling Christians. If there is, that's the first one. The lesson for us today that Jesus is teaching is you're being asked to move from being skeptics to being servants, from being grumblers to being givers, from being complainers to being a part of a community. Uh, talking about servanthood is not easy. I don't, uh, I don't often use those words naturally because they're freighted with some challenges. If we're going to understand it, some think servanthood is a way to be more important than others. Some think it's a way to, well, show how humble you are. Weird Al uh, talks about the humble Amish one. Have you heard that? The humble Amish says, oh, my brother, I am one million times more humble than thou art. <laughs> Servanthood is a way to put oneself forward in the wrong kind of way, but Jesus modeled something else, right? Remember Philippians 2? He took upon himself the form of a servant. It's a sign of true humility. This, you see, is a foot-washing Messiah. So we come here today to consecrate not just the gifts of money, but also the gifts that you share uh, in all the ways you support this church. Frankly, this sermon uh, was slow in coming. It's been a busy week. I slipped in here on Friday morning thinking I would pray for a while, and instead there were eight women all working in the pews. They were our pew pocket stuffers. Do you know that they exist? You should. They're the sort of servants I'm talking about. Quietly making sure everything is in order. Oh, there are many others around here. You know about the chain gang. They work to keep the facilities in shape, but there are people who work to decorate at various holidays, at Advent and at, at Thanksgiving. Uh, there are people who come and share other gifts quietly, not expecting to take a bow anywhere. They understand that to be a servant in Jesus' movement is to be part of a community of servants who serve one another and look out for one another. This Commitment Sunday, I want you to know that we're wanting to move ahead accepting all the gifts that are there. You've shown such generosity. Even before we got to this Sunday, this Consecration Sunday, there were already 500 pledges that had come in for over $160,000. Over half of those had increased their commitments over last year. This is a way to set the table for our next pastor. So when that pastor stands here next October, he or she can brag, well, we're a little ahead on our budget this year. That's what you can help do in many ways. And God willing, I'll be back in Indiana smiling and applauding. All these are ways we share. Jesus is asking to follow the model of not seeking status but serving others. There's an urgency at the heart of this talk. The verb to serve that's used here is one about the angels coming to serve Jesus in the wilderness, or it's used when you know Simon Peter's mother-in-law is healed and she immediately gets up and starts serving those around her. It's a time of giving away, of moving quickly. That's the life of Christ. Albert Schweitzer, in that well-known quotation, put it this way. He was asked who was the greatest living person on earth, and without hesitation, Schweitzer said, 
The greatest person in the world is some unknown individual who at this very moment has gone in love to help another person in need. Parker Palmer tells about a friend who came to visit him at a Quaker meeting, you know, where they sit in silence for their service. And the friend was not familiar with this. It was at Pendle Hill Retreats, Pendle Hill Retreat Center in Pennsylvania. The visitor sat there for five minutes and then eight minutes and then 10 minutes and all was quiet. And finally he leaned over to Parker and said, uh, when, when, when does the service start? Parker whispered to him, as soon as the worship is over. I was pastor of a church uh, some years ago. Many people liked what I did, a few of them didn't. I went to every door, boy it would take a lot here, that had an exit sign and I put another sign up beside it. Instead of uh, exit, it was just cardboard, but it read, as you're going out the door, into the world, the sign you read were these words, servants, entrance. And so Henry Nouwen sums up the questions with these questions. See them again. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentments? Did I forgive? Did I love? These, he says, are the real questions. Amen. And now, as the ushers come forward to receive our weekly tithes and offerings, we'll also uh, invite you to place in the plate your pledge card for the stewardship campaign of 2019. Whether you plan to give online or not, please go ahead and let us know your intentions by uh, sharing your pledge card with us this morning. The ushers will come to wait upon us.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We give in grateful thanksgiving for all that God has given us. In the upside down world of the gospel, we measure our wealth not by what we have, but what we can give away. Let us give away generously in this offering to bless your church, your people, your creation. Amen. Depart now as God's people in quiet service to others in need. May you go in the peace of Christ, the creator, the redeemer, and the sanctifying spirit. Amen. <laughs> 